All right, welcome everybody to the April 20th Hyperledger Technical Oversight Committee call. Uh, as you are probably all aware, two things that we must abide by on the call. The first is the antitrust policy that has been displayed on the screen. And the second is our code of conduct, which is linked in the agenda. Uh, so then for announcements today, we have our standard announcement, uh, the Dev Weekly Developer Newsletter goes out each Friday. If you do have anything that you would like to include in that newsletter, please do leave a link uh, or a comment on the, the link that's in the agenda. The second thing is a reminder. Uh, so I think it was a couple weeks ago, Hart had uh, shared the security pol policy vulnerability disclosure template draft uh, and asked for us to provide feedback. I know there's been a couple of people that have provided feedback for that, but um, please do have a look at that and uh, provide your feedback for Hart um, so that he can make forward progress with that. And then any other announcements that anybody would like to make today? Sure. Um, I, this is just for people that opted into the large runner beta. Um, I apologize for the turbulence over the last week. I, I've talked to GitHub for quite a while. What I've done is set up specific groups uh, for the runners so that uh, one project does not starve all the other projects. and. Uh, I'm working on adjusting the limits. Uh, they were set wide open at the beginning. I think I've set it to five by default for uh, projects that are in uh, incubation state and a much larger number for projects that have graduated. I don't remember what that is off the top of my head. Um, let's just take a look. And the really frustrating thing is you have to set that limit per type. Uh, so. They have Fabric has 25. They don't use Windows that much. They have five. And they don't use Ubuntu latest that much. They have five. So they're mostly using this. So that's what I've set. If you run into really long delays, please just reach out and say, hey, um, help me out. So that's all I want to say. All right. Thanks, Fred. Any other announcements that anybody has you would like to make? No. Okay. Uh, for quarterly reports, we did get the fabric report in uh, this week, Dave. Thank you for that. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to take a look at that, please do so. I do believe there are quite a few outstanding reviews that still need to happen. Um, so, but as far as so what I've seen so far, there are no questions or comments on that particular report. But any, uh, are there any questions that anybody would like to bring up here in the TOC meeting about the Hyperledger Fabric report? No, okay. Uh, so then for past due reports, uh, the Transact report, Arun did reach out last week after our call directly to Andre and Sean uh, regarding the pull request. It has since been merged. Um, the interesting thing about that pull request is uh, the way that Peter wrote it basically says that the Hyperledger Transact code base is now maintained as part of Hyperledger Sawtooth library repository, um, which implies to me that uh, we could uh, think about the end of life for Hyperledger Transact, given the, the way that that's been stated is that it's no longer maintained within Hyperledger Transact. Any thoughts on doing that? Um, Peter? If they agree, I think it makes sense to end of life it, but also it doesn't matter too much to me as long as we have that link and the explanation saying go to the other link because that's where these, this is being maintained. Uh, I could also see someone making the argument that end of lifing it makes it sound like everyone just went home and it's over, but it's not over. It just moves over into Sawtooth. 
So I would also be willing to accept arguments like that, why it shouldn't be, shouldn't have some sort of big end of life sign on the GitHub repository. But what's more interesting as a question is uh, the website. Like, do we, do we merge the two projects on the website? Probably yes. But uh, yeah, to me, that's, it's, that's more important in my opinion, than the GitHub repository and the fly thing. All right, thanks, Peter. Any other thoughts on that? As someone that doesn't have a vote, um, I'm for it. Um, they're a month late on this uh, report. They said that the stuff moved somewhere else. And selfishly, it would make my life easier um, if we didn't have dead projects um, that people ended up in, in these contribution pathways that are over. All right. Actually, it's almost two months now, looking at the dates. Other, other thoughts? Daniel? Doing what I shouldn't be doing, uh, raising my hand. Um, just want to let everybody know that uh, we have reached out to Sean specifically, um, and I will again, um, and I will ask him to make sure that he uh, reviews, they, they, the retailers review uh, what's being proposed and discussed, and, um, and hopefully by next week, maybe we'll show up to that. Talk to the team there. Okay. And Daniela, um, I guess the the question that I have for you, uh, obviously knowing that you're driving. Um, should we think about creating a an issue like we did for grid where we uh, reach out to the maintainers to to mark it as end of life or should we wait for the conversation um that you plan to have with sean i think we, we need to wait another week okay All right did i just hear their report is just one month late we've it, made reports for... it's actually two months late I will make it a priority to get an answer by next Thursday. Okay, no problem. Uh, so you. we will, yeah, thank you, Daniela. Uh, we'll wait for that and then uh, let us know, Daniela, we can always open a, uh, an issue like we did the last time as well, um, just to get that resolved after the conversation. All right, uh, so then the next one that we have is Ursa. Um, that is, um, just a month overdue for Ursa. Uh, I know there's been some comments. There was a reminder sent out on the 13th with a response that came back asking, where do we submit this? Um, so we will um, we'll get a room to send another reminder today to see if we can get any sort of additional updates. My guess is obviously with IIW this week, there's a possibility that people are um, are at IIW and, and not necessarily taking a look at uh, what needs to be done here. So we'll uh, send out a message and see if we can get a response back on Ursa. Any questions, additional comments on the, the past two reports? Nope, okay. Uh, so for upcoming reports, we do have the Sawtooth report that is due next Thursday. Uh, so we'll keep an eye out for that and see if we can get the Sawtooth report coming in. All right. So then uh, as far as an agenda for today, uh, topics for discussion, we do have the task force discussion on project best practices. 
before we get to that, is there anything else that uh, people would like to discuss? Anything else that needs to have the TOCs um, kind of look at? Anything that we need to, to discuss? If I may, we are not late with the Iroha report, right? Uh, no, I don't think you're late with the Iroha report. Okay. I think that one's coming up soon. Okay, I will, I will address it. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Quat Rai. I was going to do that too. Yeah, so May 11th is the next time that we've got the Iroha report due. Thanks. All right, any other discussion items for today before we hand it off to Dave to walk us through the project best practices? All right, Dave, I guess it's up to you. Okay, let me share. Okay, do you see it? We do. All right. Uh, so going back up to the top, we've made a lot of good progress in the last few sessions going through these best practices. I think it's kind of, it's met my goals pretty much, I think, in terms of uh, providing a survey at kind of a high level uh, summary of best practices with, of course, deeper discussions and other task forces and that type of thing. Um, we're coming to the end of this, and I think we'll probably finish it out today with the last two sections around GitHub configuration and GitHub workflow suggestions. Um, after we do this, then I can um, push a pull request into the TOC space uh, to capture all this for eternity. Um, of course, we'll, there, will, there, will, there will always be um, other task forces and things. So this will be a living document that I think we'll update over time and also have a lot of links to other good information out there. But I think this has been a really good survey. So let's dive into GitHub configuration today. This one's a little bit dry, but um, so it's good to define um, your GitHub configuration in uh, settings.yaml so that they can be managed and tracked via pull requests. And I have an example here of fabrics. I'm not saying fabrics is the best, but this one is pretty cut and dry. So there's nothing too opinionated here. Um, I think the next one, branch protection rules, there's a little bit more leeway for opinion and it kind of gets into the weeds. So I don't know if we want to go through that in detail here. I was thinking maybe of going offline with Rye and anybody else who is interested uh, if we want to suggest a best starting place. But if you're not familiar with branch pr protection rules, let me just show you in Fabrics. This is where you can really get into the weeds of the GitHub configuration. So there's just a whole lot of options you know, some of these, I think we would definitely, as a TOC and, and st staff, have suggestions on. There are other ones that are probably up to the project, um, but it might be good to um, go through these uh, with a smaller group of people and figure out which of these do we actually want to recommend. Um, what, do, what do folks think? Does that make sense? I don't think you want to go through each and every bullet in this meeting, do you? There are some things that um, I want to, I would like to point out if you scroll up a little bit. Um, so the, yeah, scroll down a little bit more. Sorry. Uh, okay, keep going down. Um, the require linear history. Um, basically does a rebase, gives you the rebase option on merge. Um, if you're trying to keep merges out, require merge queue. I know that uh, Bezu messed with that for a while and they found that it was uh, really um, uh, difficult to get working well. Um, if you scroll down off this page, do, 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 do. Um, is this which branch is this for main this is main yeah scroll back up a little bit um 
do not allow bypassing of the above settings is um, neither here nor there. Um, you know, you have to think about who is going to do that. It's going to be people that are administrators. And uh, I thought there was another setting in here. Uh, 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 so do you one... see anything that sh we should change here? I guess I'll ask no, that. No, no. Do, you, do you suggest that we do this linear history? No, that's uh, I, I was pointing out because it's kind of a weird setting. I like linear history. I don't like merges. Um, but I, really... I agree. But so would you would you recommend we check that one? Uh, it it's I would recommend that you do, but um, it does mean another round of CI uh, for a merge. So it does make it slower. Um, so there are pros and cons. Um, okay, so we'll leave it up to the project now. Yeah, uh, and I'm looking for the one that says uh, PR must be up to date before it's merged or before it, uh, did it yeah, so that, that checkbox uh like triples your ci time before you can merge something so if your project has this set i would say don't do that um you know it's because if i'm on a pr and this box is checked and i have merge approval that means i need to rebase it to on main run the ci and then merge it and then that runs the ci again so you're running the CI when, you know, for it to be approved before I can merge it and then after it's merged. So I would really um, counsel against enabling that particular feature. And I think that's the only thing, that's the only setting there that uh, really makes life hard. So, okay, so maybe what I'll do is take a screenshot of this when I do the pull request, uh, assuming this is a good place to start. And I'll highlight some of the ones you just mentioned there as as ones to consider checking or unchecking. Sure. Um, and then uh, last, so if you scroll down to show that status checks required, so that you are on it, that that window that says GitHub Actions, the required status checks. Uh, I would say keep this limited. One way that you can do that is by using reusable workflows, and have a workflow. That's kind of a the the first mer uh, workflow that the other ones are dependent on. Make the success of that workflow depend on the ones that are important, and then uh, just have that one or two of these checks. So DCO yes, but all these integration checks. There might be like a an integration test workflow that consumes those workflows and reports one action. What that allows you to do as as a maintainer is you can change what is required or not uh, based on what what tests that consumes, and you don't have to come in here and fiddle around with this interface. So it would make your life easier. Okay. Um, so I think that's it, Peter. The last sentence you just said, I don't understand. I don't know very well how the workflow slash actions connections go. Is there some link, YouTube video, anything that I could look at for details on how to check that out? Sure. Um, the term that you want to search for, I'll get a link, but the term that you want to search for is reusable GitHub action mm -hmm. um, or using reusable GitHub actions. And that will... Um, that will show you, you and uh, yeah, that that makes life easier because then you can just edit the, uh, when, when you check in a workflow, you can edit the dependent uh, workflow. And if, if you don't want it to be required, you can set the, uh, you know, if fail, don't worry about it in the mass, in the uh, primary workflow. So I, I will dig that up and uh, I will show you. Yep. Primary workflow. But yeah. then for me to set that up, I would I would still need to send the pull request with the YAML change. 
Right. But that gets you away from having to go into the 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 GitHub UI and mess around with making certain ones required or certain ones not. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, that sounds good. Anybody else want to highlight any of these settings? Okay, so like I said, I will take a screenshot of this, put this in the pull request, um, and highlight a few of the ones that Rye mentioned. David, looks like Peter raised his hand again. Peter. Yeah, sorry, it's me again. I just wanted to say that uh, one little optimization I found is uh, if you merge by hand, but on a rebase uh, branch, then you can keep the same uh, commit hash on the main branch that you had on your feature branch. You just have to merge on the command line and with the option that says fast forward only so that it does not create a merge commit at all. And if it was forced, then it would actually just fail instead of doing the merge. What this does then is after you merged, uh, it is the same commit hash. So the CI does not need to redo everything when it went on the main branch. And uh, going slightly off topic with it, but the other good thing about this is that it preserves the signatures, not the sign offs, but the signatures. So if you ever saw a commit log on GitHub that had the little green label that said verified next to a commit, that's because uh, the pull request was merged in a way that the commit hash remained the same uh, as it was when it was on the feature branch. And this is kind of going into the other thing, which is the security aspect of everything. But I just wanted to put it out there in case people didn't know. OK, so in one bullet, how how do you do that? Rebase with fast forward option? Uh, with fast forward only option. So it's a dash dash f f dash only. And then it's not rebase, it's merge. But uh, you do have to rebase it first to make sure that the fast forwarding is uh, feasible. Thanks, Rye. Yes, like that. Okay, yeah, so you were jumping ahead to GitHub workflow, that's fine. All right, while Rye finishes that, um, we can finish out the GitHub configuration. So the other thing I was noting uh, is the code owners might be good. So if you have different uh, owners per directory, this is where this comes in handy. I'll show you the fabric example of this. So we have a um, separate set of doc maintainers uh, or additional set of maintainers that can also maintain the docs. So we have a docs directory. So this is, I think, pretty common for GitHub projects to use. Um, I didn't know about it at first when I was new, but that's a good thing to highlight, I think. Uh, and then lastly, um, using pull request templates and issue templates can help guide your users um, into opening good pull requests and good issues. Um, and you can also do things like um, point out the Discord chat channel. So when, in our issue template, we have, uh, let me pull it up. If you go to open a new issue, you get this template saying, I want to open a bug or a feature request. Um, but you can also, we also say, if you just want support or help, uh, we have Discord and a mailing list that you can go to instead. So you don't get a bunch of bogus issues that are just um, user questions for help. 
and then the pull request template is kind of the same thing. Um, you know, you can make sure that they specify what type of change it is. If there's a release note needed, uh, make sure that they run the checks themselves, that type of thing. So just a good thing for new contributors to be aware of as they're opening pull requests or new issues. Any other thoughts on these? Art? Hey, um, can you all hear me? Yes. Great, sorry, I'm in the car as well. Um, I would like us to consider more strongly recommending uh, code owners. Um, I get a lot of questions and I think other people do as well about you know people who are interested in a project and they wanna know who to talk to about some particular feature of the project. Uh, and the code owners makes this really easy to find for them uh, and, you know, potentially, you know, decreases the number of communication hops that they have to take to get to what they want. Uh, and, you know, sort of each hop has a chance of failure. So I would, you know, I, I don't know what other people think, but I would think that we would want stronger language on code owners. Anybody we else? also have the um, scope field in the maintainers document that we've just recommended people do that might that's more a little bit more freeform way of doing the same thing. Yeah, e either way, I think would be good. Uh, but I would like a, I think it would be great if we, you know, required or strongly recommended one or something like that. Because the code owners is a little, you know, that impacts your ability to maintain the file. So it's good information, but it also might be a detriment in terms of the project maintenance because often any, any of the maintainers can touch any of the files and sometimes they do need to. If we start putting a bunch of restrictions in code owners, that might tie the hands a little bit. Um, okay, so you think this is better in uh, the scope? I kind of do, but maybe the thing to do is put a note in the code owners to see the maintainer scope um, list for, for kind of the more uh, freehand way of communicating yeah, this. I think that's fine. As long as this information is easy to find and communicate, you know, I, I'm okay wherever it is. So yeah, if, 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 uh, if you think that's too restrictive on code owners, totally. Well, I think the, it'd be project by project, but. Yeah, so I, I agree. Um, I, I think code owners um, is the way to go for giving people the ability to do things, but not everyone that has the ability to do things is necessarily wants to be contacted about, you know, they're not the subject matter expert, they're just a, one of the code owners. Um, so I, I, I like that having uh, the, the note to say, hey, if you're trying to figure out who to talk to, please look in the maintainer's file. As long as the maintainer's file is up to date. <laughs> Great. Okay, sounds good. And one of the projects I'm working on in my infinite free time is to uh, uh, set up Sheriff, which is a CNCF project um to maintain org ownership um i see you peter um the uh what that would allow us to do is have one repo where all this is expressed in terms of who does what and then it automatically gets updated um but i took one bite of that apple i couldn't eat it and i'm getting ready to go back against it Okay, anything else in configuration we want to mention? All right, so let's go to workflow. Um, so anybody who's used Git and GitHub knows that there's innumerable ways of doing things uh, with the same outcome, but I think there is value in defining a suggested path, both both for new users that are getting getting up to speed on GitHub and for the sake of project consistency of and ways of doing things on a certain project. 
um, I'll jump to the last bullet first. So in Fabric, we have this um, GitHub contribution suggestions. Um, it walks you through everything from um, forking and cloning to creating a feature branch, uh, opening a pull request, amending a pull request, uh, cherry picking the pull request, um, cleaning up your, your branches. Um, so a lot of, of course, this information is all over the place on the internet, um, but it just was really helpful to put this all in one place and to have some suggested practices in here as well. For example, we recommend uh, amending commits rather than um, squashing just because it keeps the um, commit history cleaner and the pull request description cleaner. So we, we, you can kind of put little uh, suggestions in these types of documents as well. So I think that's been really helpful and I've pointed a lot of new users to that document. Uh, in terms of the some of the opinionated things, um, we prefer the rebase merging uh, to keep the commit history clean, a linear path. I think that's aligned with what Rai was saying and what um, Peter was saying as well. Does that make sense, guys? It's a little bit opinionated, but I think it's uh, it's been a, a good thing that we've done. Um, like I mentioned, we'd suggest users amend commits. So if you don't really care about having tracking the full history uh, of all your changes in a pull request, it's better to to amend the commit um, rather than squashing it and having your your pull pull request description stomped on. We use. Actually, we got a couple of hands. Uh, Dave. Sorry, Rama. Yeah, uh, sorry. This is a question about the fabric guidance doc. So it doesn't look like it's uh, specific to fabric, and it looks like a lot of good information that all of the project could use. So what should we do? Should we? Do you think it'd be good to move that to a more centralized location, or should different other projects which don't want to uh, recreate the same document just link to the fabric guidance doc? Yeah, you're talking about this one? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea. I guess it depends if there's enough uh, agreement among the other projects that this is a good path. It looks pretty confident to me. Okay, are there other hands? Yeah, Peter's got a send up. Peter. I just wanted to say that the line that says amend commits instead of squashing commits, I agree, but I would add something to clarify that if you already have multiple commits, then I would recommend to squash them anyway. Just don't get into that state where you have to squash them and amend instead. Okay. Thank you. Right, so what I would recommend, um, since we're basically recreating uh, Garrett via GitHub, um, is that if you have a long chain of commits, each of those commits, there's a good, um, write up that I'll find a thing on, on like, what is a good commit? Um, each commit in your chain should be a, a topic or a, you know, a thought, right? In this commit, I'm changing the way that this functions and adding tests. And then in the next commit, you can do a, uh, I'm changing like some other thing. So, you know, that's uh, slightly different uh, so that it's easier to review each commit and I will point out that if you do a git rebase da dash I, um, you can change the order of commits in your history. Um, so you can go through and pick like the four commits that were one thing, move them in one place, and then set them to be, you know, using F instead of S. You can use F to, to fold them into one commit. And that way you present a, a linear chain of your, of your, uh, of your progress 
separated into into each commit being a topic or a part of that progress instead of the 400 commits or whatever that it took. Um, you know, it does make get bisect a little bit easier. Um, however, uh, I, I would much prefer the way that uh, that uh, you just outlined where, you know, each PR is small enough that it's just one commit. So that's, I don't know, a long way of saying I love Garrett. Yeah. Uh, sorry, is it Peter? Yeah, go ahead, Peter. Uh, I I feel bad because Rama still has his hand up. No, I think you you put your hand up first. Okay. Oh, okay. Sorry. I yeah. Then with all that said, then we should, we could also put down could or should that uh, next to the commit amending suggestion, which is that if your commit grows to be more than one logical, clear thing, then you should just open multiple pull requests instead of stacking a bunch of commits into a single pull request. But I don't know how deep this rabbit hole we want to go because it's a big one. <laughs> Uh, just wanted a clarification from Rai. Uh, so we have several different commits related to different features. Uh, we'll only be able to uh, combine the features uh, corresponding to, I mean, combine the commits corresponding to a particular feature into one if they're contiguous, right? I mean, if they're all interspersed, like, uh, will, will they be able to do that, sir? I mean, uh, if, like, if one commit is uh, uh, related to particular feature one, that next commit is related to feature two, the third commit again to feature one, then will it still work? The way you suggest? Um, so, y what you can do, if I understand, is if you do the git rebase dash i, you could change the order of commits so that the two feature ones were next to each other mm -hmm. and then you can squash them um okay uh, but if they're really two different yeah. things you might want to make that two different pull requests right yes. rather than squashing them into one could could i uh share my screen sure. for a second dave yeah so i just picked a random repo and I did a git, I did a git rebase head and dash three. So what I could do is go in here and say, uh, this is actually part of, because should come before that. And then I could go down here and say, you know, either S to squash it and preserve the commit message or F uh, and fix it up. Uh, and then you have all the options down here, like break, drop, label, reset. So, you know, git rebase dash I is a really powerful tool for controlling your uh, git history. Um, so I would suggest taking a look at that. And I don't think that's available uh, in any way in the uh, GitHub UI. You can go ahead and share, David. Okay, yeah, I mean, we could go on and on with this, but I think Rama's initial point is good that maybe we take this contributions doc with kind of the suggestions in it and make this uh, something on the Hyperledger site instead of just the fabric docs. And okay, then, I misunderstood this question, I apologize. Yeah, so I don't know where we'd put this, but we'll find a place to put this and maybe open a pull request and we can people can inject their own ideas think, like we can we can put the rebase dash I in here and things like that. I think that would go in uh, in the talk uh, recommended practices thing. Okay. Um, so that's where I would park that. I don't know. Tracy thoughts. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Uh, we have those guidelines on the talk site. Oh, we could probably put that there.
yeah, I mean, we have to be a little careful because we can end up rewriting good documentation if we go far enough, but try to keep it to the main points, I guess. Art. Thanks, Tracy. So I do want to say that I talked to some people at IW yesterday who are interested in submitting a new project to Hyperledger. Uh, and one of the questions I got was, you know, just a bunch of stuff about best practices, uh, you know, <clears throat> taking developers who aren't used to open source and, and getting them uh, into, you know, following open source best practices. So sort of, you know, the more, uh, the more public and visible we, we can make this and even the more detailed, I, I'm fine adding all of these extra details and, and tips that people have uh, because I think people will really appreciate it. Okay. Yeah. And Peter. Uh, one more thing I would add to either the top or the bottom of that document that ends up on the website is some reference to one of the Discord channels where people could go and ask clarifying questions about this because I know that Everything I know about Git and how to do these things or how I like to do these things formed over years of trial and error. And I know from memory that if you showed me the best practices that I am recommending today, if you showed the, those to me 10 years ago, then I would not have even understood half of what you actually mean by doing these things. So I think a lot of people would need some sort of more specific guidance, but obviously the documentation itself cannot answer all of those questions in advance because that would be just impossible and the giant rabbit hole. Uh, that would just lead to us updating Git's documentation itself. Uh, so I would put a reference to some Discord channel, either an existing one or a brand new dedicated one that is like Git helpline or something. We also get a lot of requests uh, for a lot of people show up in general, skip through, you know, skip past the sign up screen that says, if you have questions about this, go here and ask uh, where they should ask questions. Uh, I would recommend, I think, that so we have general, we have like pound fabric, um, but there might be. Uh, I, I don't know, like pound fabric dash newbie questions or something like that. Uh, I, I'm wary of 8 million channels. Uh, but, you know, it, it uh, we would need people from the project to, to be there to, to answer the newbie questions. So I, I don't know. I guess I don't have a fully formed thought about that, but I will create the get questions channel. Yeah, I think that's a general one that would span across projects, right? Yeah. Just general get questions for Hyperledger users. Peter? I can volunteer to monitor the channel. I feel like I've gotten better at answering good questions just because a big chunk of the pull request reviews that I do are basically just do this with Git, do, do that with Git, and then the contributors being like, what? What does that even mean? And then I have to explain it. So I, I anyway have plans to produce YouTube videos as well to just show what I mean. And uh, me volunteering to, to help out with this channel and monitor it will probably push me in the right direction of actually making those videos reality. All right, DM Peter. 
<laughs> Maybe not the. Uh... <laughs> but yeah, tag. They can tag me on the channel so that the knowledge is reused and I am not answering the exact same question 15 times every day. Good luck. All right. That. This is good. Yeah. <clears throat> <laughs> I know. I know. And I did. And I just. I was just going to say, right? I just saw your Get Help uh, channel show up. Yep. And I tagged everybody in there so you can see where it is. And I think you all have permission to edit the channel. So if someone wants to uh, make it less basic, please go ahead. And what's the name? Get Help? Yeah. Get Dash Help. Okay. Okay, any other hands up? No. All right, any other thoughts on these two? Okay, so like I said, to summarize, I will create one pull request for this document, and then I will do another one for an initial um, GitHub contributions document. Sounds good. Okay. Any parting words? Okay. Well, thanks everybody for the input here. All right. Thanks, Dave, for uh, taking us through that. Um, is there anything else with this task force that needs to be done after those pull requests? Or uh, do we think those pull requests are basically what was intended to be accomplished with this task force? Uh, I think that'll be close to being it, but maybe put me on one last time on the agenda and four weeks or whatever it is, and we'll see if there's anything. There's probably a couple of loose ends that need to be tied up still. Okay, sounds great. Sounds great. All right, uh, so thank you so much, Dave, for taking us through that today. Any other topics or anything else that anybody would like to bring up before we close for today? Nope. Okay. So I guess then for next week, we have the security task force. As a reminder, again, please do review that draft that uh, Hart put out there, uh, and provide your comments and feedback on that. And I'm sure we will uh, want to do a, a final kind of close out on that in the discussion next week. And with that, I will let you all go off to prepare for your next meetings and uh, have a uh, at least a couple minutes before then. So thanks all for attending today. We will talk again next week. Thanks, everybody.